Eu estou aqui com o David Friedman. I wanted to start by saying that I too have homeschooled my children. Not, not Patry. He was brought up by his mother. Uh, and I would like to invite the previous speaker to solve his problems by moving to California. Uh, more or less by accident, California has effectively unregulated uh, homeschooling. Uh, if you want to home school, you fill out a form announcing that your home is a school. You are supposed to keep various records, none of which anybody will ever ask to see, and you then proceed. Uh, but that wasn't what I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, there are always problems in translation, as all of you know, and when I read the schedule for this event, it was not clear to me that people would correctly deduce from the Portuguese title what the English title of my talk had been. So I thought I would give that to you first. The title of my talk is Anarchy and Efficient Law. And that is also the title of a book chapter I wrote many years ago. Uh, and I want to start with a problem. And it is a problem that I think uh, all, most libertarians, uh, all free market conservatives, all classical liberals face. And the problem is that all of these groups believe that governments are very bad at doing things. That if you have the government produce cars, your cars will be expensive and will break down. If you have government produce food, it will be expensive and you may be hungry. And the conclusion that all of these people reach is that the solution is to have a legal regime in which production is private, in which agriculture and uh, cars and for the more radical people even schooling is produced privately by individuals by voluntary association. And this clearly sounds like a very attractive idea. And then you think a little longer and so the solution is that the government, which is incompetent to produce things, will produce a legal regime in which things are done in this fashion. And that sounds a little less plausible because as those who have actually studied law realize, law is not a simple problem. That with the best will in the world, there are a great many very complicated issues in figuring out what the law ought to be. I think constructing a legal system is probably even harder than designing an automobile. And if the government cannot design automobiles, why do you think it can design a decent legal system? And of course, with regard to the legal system as with regard to the automobiles, there are really two problems. The first is a problem of competence, and the second is a problem of incentives. That is to say, one reason, if I take a much more modest example, one reason why the main effect of the interventions of the U.S. government in U.S. agriculture has for 70 years been to make food more expensive is that what the government is trying to do is not to make food less expensive but to make farmers richer. That is to say, farm program in the, U in the U.S., as in many but not all other countries, is essentially a program to buy the votes of the farm states by enriching farmers at the expense of city people. And for reasons, some of which my son suggested in his earlier talk, it often is politically profitable to benefit relatively concentrated interest groups at the expense of dispersed interest groups, and this is one more example. Similarly, one would expect that a government that was designing a legal system not only would not be competent to do so, it would have no particular reason to develop a good legal system that they would like to develop a legal system that serves a range of political objectives. Some of them might be desirable, some undesirable, but actually making a system that makes people richer or freer is not very high up in that list of priorities. And there's no particular reason why it should be. Political actors, uh, politicians, and voters, and judges, all of the people in the system, including all of us, each is a rational individual pursuing his own ends, just as in the marketplace. And in the political system, unlike the marketplace, there's no reason in general to expect that process to produce attractive results. If people are interested in a more general discussion of that issue, I gave a talk not long ago, which you can find links to my webpage, 
on what economists call market failure, which is basically situations where individual rationality does not lead to group rationality. And I offered reasons, some of which my son has just suggested, why in the political system market failure is the norm. If you think of the political system as a marketplace, it's a marketplace in which we cannot expect individual rationality to produce group rational results. If that's the case, uh, then we have an obvious problem. How could you set up a set of human institutions which would generate good law? If you think of the problem as uh, under what circumstances will it be in the individual interests of the people making the law to do it right? How would you do that? And for people who believe in free markets, your first sort of guess is to say, well, we obviously need some kind of a market production of law. And that sounds like a somewhat odd idea because we're used to law as something that's made and enforced by the state. Uh, in fact, there are examples of market produced law. As you may know, a lot of commercial legal disputes are handled by private arbitration. Arbitrators have legal rules they act according to. Since in order for arbitrators to get business, they have to offer legal rules that companies want to be under for disputes between companies, the arbitrators have an incentive to try to generate, in some sense, well-designed legal rules. And the question is, could you do anything like that in a broader and more general sense? Could you set up a set of social institutions where the same sorts of forces that give us good cars and good cell phones and good food would also give us good law. And I believe that I proposed 30-some uh, years ago a solution to that problem, and that's the solution I want to discuss and to try to explain, first, how the society I imagine would function, second, why it would tend to produce economically efficient law, and third, why it would only tend to, why, as in most market situations, the result will not be perfect, there will be certain predictable ways in which even the best institutions I can think of will get things wrong. And the argument for them is only they will get them less wrong than any other alternative that I know of. Uh, so let me start by sketching out what I think of as a, a hypothetical set of institutions for an orderly private property market society with no government. And so the basic problem is how do you enforce rights? How do you make sure that contracts are kept, that people's don't, people don't rob from each other, kill each other, and so forth? And I want to start out with the easiest problem. And I'm going to try to show you that there is one subset of that problem which more or less solves itself. And then try to convince you that I can leverage that subset into doing the whole job. And the subset of the problem is the problem of enforcing contracts between people who are interacting with each other for a long period of time. If you think about uh, two people who are engaged in a joint project, or two firms that will be expect to be dealing with each other for the next 20 years, in that situation, you can enforce contracts pretty well without any enforcement mechanism because I know that if I cheat you this year, you will refuse to do business with me next year. All right? That's what is sometimes referred to as the discipline of, con of constant dealing, that you have an automatic enforcement system for human beings if you are having repeat dealings with somebody and they can stop dealing with you if, if you break your word, cheat, and so forth. Right. Now let's see how we can solve the much harder problem of how do I enforce my rights against a mugger who has no particular desire to do business with me, how I can enforce a contract that I only have once with somebody where there's no repeat dealing, and so forth. So I want to imagine a society where the enforcement of rights is a private industry. We have private firms, hopefully quite a lot of private firms, and they have customers, and I pay my private rights enforcement firm uh, some annual fee in exchange for which they agree that they will protect me from murder and robbery, will arrange that my contracts be enforced, will arrange that my disputes with other people are peacefully settled, and so forth. So to start with, we imagine a society like Brazil or America where there are a bunch of firms of this sort and where almost everybody is a customer of one such firm. 
and the problem which this system is obvious to everybody. Uh, you have no an idea how many people, how many times I have been told why this couldn't possibly work. And the problem is what happens when uh, my television set vanishes from my living room and my rights enforcement agency, being a high-tech agency, has installed a camera in my living room in advance, which took a picture of my friend here walking out the door with my television. And so my agency, having identified the picture, uh, goes, sends uh, a polite gentleman to him, asking for my television back, and asking him to also pay them an extra hundred dollars for their time and trouble in retrieving it. And he replies that he has never seen me before, that he got this television from an old friend uh, six months ago, and that they should go about their business. And so my agency explains to him that unless he can show them reasons to think that he did not steal my television, they will be showing up at his door tomorrow with three strong men to retrieve the television. And he responds, ah, but I too have a rights enforcement agency. And if you come with your three goons and try to take my television away, my agency will come with five goons and protect me. And you then have the beginning of a war, and that is why many people from Ayn Rand on down have argued that such a system could not possibly work. But I think that's the wrong story. That's not what really happens. And the reason that it isn't what really happens is that wars are very expensive. And private firms wish to minimize their costs. And so my agency says to itself, if we try to send six goons against his five goons, someone will get hurt, the television may get broken, we're going to have to start paying hazard pay to our employees. This does not look good for the bottom line. Let's call up his agency and discuss the problem. And both agencies realize that violent conflict is expensive and risky, and that the sensible thing to do is to find some neutral arbitrator who will decide who the television set belongs to. And since they can see that this problem will occur again and again in the future, the sensible thing to do is to pre-commit. That my agency makes an agreement with his agency, which says when such disputes occur, we will go to the private arbitrator over there, who has a good reputation, is a competent sort of private judge, and we will accept his verdict. And if he says that our customer is in the wrong, we won't protect our customer. And we'll make it clear to our customers that we do not protect them when they steal television sets. If they say that our customer is in the right, then your agency agrees that if our customer was accused, you will apologize and make him some compensation. And if our customer was the victim, you will turn over your customer to be punished or make him pay reimbursement. So the basic argument is that we solve this problem by a network of private contracts in which each pair of agencies agrees on a private arbitrator to settle disputes. But now you say, wait a minute, this is a world with no government. So who enforces those private contracts? Ah, but that problem we have already solved. Because as I started out by saying, the one kind of enforcement of contracts that does not require the government is the enforcement of contracts between firms that expect to be dealing with each other for a long time. And my agency and his agency are such a pair of firms. So that if the next time there is a dispute, my agency uh, goes to the arbitrator, and the arbitrator says, he didn't steal the television set, you made a mistake. If my agency says, we don't care, we're going to take the television set, then his agency will refuse to abide by arbitration in the future, and they'll have to fight each other all the time, and their costs will be very high, and they will gradually lose their customers to other agencies that have more sensible and honest and honorable policies and are willing to keep their contracts with each other for arbitration. All right. So that's the basic framework sort of of a simple model of an anarcho-capitalist society. And as with any picture of a real human institution, it's obviously very much simple really had it working, you would see a lot more complication than I'm describing. 